in his remarks a moment ago about how Satan tries to um, replace God in, in a lot of ways. Not just does he try to, to do <coughs> things that people will think are God, like Steve mentioned, that, that the devil will do stuff and then say, well, that's God doing that. But also, the devil sees what God really is doing, and then he tries to counterfeit that. Okay, so in our discussion that we've been doing now for several weeks about the kingdom of heaven, what we're going to talk about today is one of those things where... God does something, and we're going to see it clearly in the Scripture. And then we're also going to see clearly in the Scripture where the devil and his servants are doing the same thing. And it would require spiritual discernment, I would say, for an ordinary human to know the difference. And that's why we need to be born again and filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can discern these things because it's getting really confusing out there in the world. You know, don't leave home without the Holy Spirit. For sure. Anyway, I'm going to read this little short passage here from Matthew 13 in the King James Bible. And there's a reason that I'm doing that. Several reasons, actually. One is it it's a lot easier to look things up in Strong's Concordance if you have the King James Version. Now you can go to a Bible Gateway or some of the computer uh, Bibles online and you can look up words in Strong's Concordance that way too. But if in, in lieu of that, if you got the King James Version, then you can look up words. And I looked up a lot of words. Ended up, I'm probably not going to bring a lot of that out today, but I really liked the way that the King James Version expresses this. And it's one of his parables. See, all of these things we've been talking about, the kingdom of heaven, it's the spirit realm, okay? Kingdom means a realm. Heaven doesn't just mean, oh, that's where the, the saints go when they die. Heaven is that which is beyond, that which is out there, okay? So... There is the good side of the spirit realm and there is the bad side of the spirit realm. Or we could say there's God's side. God's in the spirit realm and Satan and his forces are in the spirit realm. We can also say that God's angels are in the spirit realm. You know, he says he makes his angels winds. Well, that's something you can't see. Unless, they, unless those angels want to be seen. And sometimes we see in the scripture that they do. You know, they appeared to Abraham. And uh, one appeared to Mary to tell her that she was going to become pregnant with the Messiah. And God says, hey, be, be good to strangers because you never know if that person next to you is an angel or not. But otherwise, angels don't... They're shapeshifters, okay, if you want to use sci-fi terms, Okay. And not just shape shifters, but form shifters. Now, this is critical to what we are going to talk about today because the title I have for this is Collective Forces. Now, in case you haven't noticed, collectivism is where the world is going. All of the things going on in our world, whether politically, economically, socially, racially, whatever, it's to bring all things together. It's like this with Steve has been ministering on Friday night about the ephah and, and how everything's being put in the ephah. Well, now, that's not a God thing. That's a Satan thing. But this is the time when collection... This is collection day here, collection time going on here. And the forces of God collect and the forces of Satan collect. All right? But it says here, Matthew 13, verse 47, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net 
Now, let me say something about this. This week has not been a joyous week for uh, media networks. Oh, I mean, I guess it depends on which side of the political fence you are. I mean, okay, first of all, Pat Robertson, who founded the Christian Broadcasting Network, died this week. Now, he went on, yeah, he went on to his, his heavenly reward. So, uh, you know, I'm not sad that, that you know, I mean, he, he, he's where he's with Jesus now. So that's a good thing. But, you know, when he formed the Christian Broadcasting Network back in 1959, there was not a lot of that kind of, I mean, that was real visionary foresight to see that you could use the power of television and not just a local broadcast. I mean, they've been doing that for a long time. But to use a network to put the gospel out. Now, there was another guy named Rex Humbard that had been doing that for probably 10 years before Pat Robertson started, and this accounted for a lot of the spread of the gospel that has happened in the last uh, 70 years. But he's gone, and we've seen a proliferation of Christian media, of media of all kinds, you know, uh, and then there is the internet also. And then uh, on the other side of the fence, CNN, the cable news network, fired their CEO this week because their numbers were so far down. Well, I can't figure that one out. Can you? It's like they're, they're in hard times and, and the morale of the workers is really, really low. It's like they don't want to work there anymore. And so, so CNN said, well, you know, it's kind of like a football coach at a high school. If the football team's doing bad, fire the coach. <laughs> right? Well, if CNN's doing bad, fire the CEO. <laughs> okay, but see, this is, these are networks. Now, here's where I'm going with this today, and th this is a concept. And I, I trust the Holy Spirit will somehow make this real to all of us because it's like, like angels, you know, it's like wins. It's like you can't really pin this down exactly. You can't exactly pin television waves and radio waves and things down. You, you can't localize them and say, well, it's all coming from right there. Okay, I mean, yeah, it kind of, you know, there's the studio and that's where, where the, the talking is going on, but it, it, it's in the air, okay? Well, that's what we're talking about here. The kingdom of heaven is like a net. All right? That was cast into the sea. Well, let's talk about that for just a moment because I think this is critical that we understand the symbolism that's used in this parable. That it's not just it's not just word pictures to, you know, give you a fanciful notion of what God's trying to say. That the scripture defines a lot of the words that are used in these parables to show us how this could be relevant for us today now, okay? Uh, keep the place there. In fact, keep the place in Matthew 13 for most of this message today and go to Revelation chapter 17. The sea is vast. It's water, okay? And, of course, other places in the Scripture, it refers to uh, words, messages, ideas, concepts, thoughts as water. You know, the, the, the devil spouts forth water and the water of the Word of God, okay? So, so a, an aquatic metaphor does uh, move beyond just, uh, we're not just talking about the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, right? The, these are metaphors, all right? And here's how it descri is described in Revelation chapter 17. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, the last judgments, the wrath of God being poured out, came and spoke to John saying, Come with me and I will show you the doom, the sentence and judgment of the great harlot who is seated on many waters. 
Now we're going to see later on here what the, the meaning of the great harlot is, how that applies to our current situation in the world today. But now go to verse 15. The angel said, the waters, the sea, if you will, that you observed where the harlot is seated are races, multitudes, nations, and dialects. They are whole cultural groups, if you will. Not just uh, black and white, or not just nationalities, but whole groups. Uh, and, and it's referred to as waters, as the sea. So we could say the sea then could be all of humanity on planet Earth. Okay, so go back to, uh, you might want to keep the place in Revelation. We'll come back there in a moment too. Um, go back to Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven, it says, is like a net that was cast into the sea. Okay, and so far what we understand is we're talking about networks that affect all humanity. All right? And they gathered every kind. Now, I know maybe your translation says every kind of fish. Well, fish isn't the only thing that's out there in the ocean. I mean, there's shrimp and there's lobster and, uh, you know, all kinds of creatures live in the ocean. So, now, that said, if you want to think of it as fish, okay. I mean, I don't know that the translators are that far off because, you know, Jesus went, his first disciples, what were they? They were fishermen, okay? And so... You know, he told Peter, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, you're going to catch people for the, for the kingdom, okay? So if you want to think of it as fish, that's fine. But the, the point I wanted to make is of every kind. You know, there's not... Okay, I realize it says in verse Corinthians that, well, there's nothing that we go through that everybody doesn't go through in some form or fashion. Yes, that's true. We're all subjected to the environment of planet Earth and the various trials that happen on planet Earth. But we're all unique. Every person is unique. Every person has their own background, their own uh, internal makeup, and their own experiences in life, etc. Um, so... When it says every kind of fish, we're talking about the net is being thrown out there and it's pulling in everybody of all kinds and they may not all see eye to eye on everything. Keep the place in chapter 13. Go to Matthew chapter 22. Well, good for you. I think that you're probably better off if you don't. <laughs> Actually, uh, Matthew 22, verse 3. Well, let's start at verse 22. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his sons. Okay, for his son. And, you know, this we could say represents the, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? And th that's something that we should be looking forward to. Steve's been talking about this on Friday night. And it's a big deal. It, and it's a bigger deal than the church tends to make it. The church, oh, it's, it's off some golden day break off in heaven. And we, you know, we, we'll, we'll never know about that till we get there. Well, <laughs> no, no. But that, he preached that Friday night. Listen to Friday night. Okay, so anyway... The marriage supper of the lambs, what we're talking about here. The king is given that in verse 3. He sent his servants to summon those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they refused to come. Now, of course, symbolically that could refer to Israel. You know, God sent his son Jesus to Israel, and by and large they didn't accept the invitation. And again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, look, I've, be, I've prepared my banquet. My bullocks and my fat calves are killed, and everything is prepared. 
come to the wedding feast. Interestingly, he mentions all the things that the Jews do on feast days. Right? So he's saying, hey, you've been, you've been observing these, these Moedim, these feasts all these years. Hey, the big one's coming, and I'm inviting you to it. And he said, no, we don't want the big one. We're happy with the, the little piddly stuff we've been doing all this time. Okay. But then go down to verse 9. So, then the king said, well, go to the thoroughfares where they leave the city. And those from the country come there and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. Every kind, see? And so the servants went out to the crossroads and gathered together as many as they found, both good and bad. One of my little, um, I won't say sins, I don't guess this is sinful, but one of my little quirky things I like to do before I go to bed at night is I like to watch internet videos of fishing. I, I like to watch these guys that stand on the bank and see what they pull in. You know, sometimes they catch these gar that are seven feet long, or <laughs> sometimes they catch a channel cattle. I say, well, what, what are they going to pull out next, you know? And, and how did, what kind of bait did they use? And, you know, how did they keep the string from breaking and all of this stuff, you know? Okay, but anyway, here in Texas, and, and I don't know, maybe this is not just a Texas thing. It seems like these days there's a lot of fishing that is catch and release, okay, that for whatever reason they don't want to eat the fish that they catch. Eh, probably good reason for that. You know, sometimes the water's polluted, okay, or, you know, maybe uh, they catch a gar, a gar's not worth eating, okay. So, but here it's, it's, you know, the net is cast out in the sea and they pull every kind of seafood in here, okay, and so the servants go out and they invite Everybody, they preach the gospel to the whole world on CBN and on, you know, all the various means to throw it out there. And you get a lot of responses. And let me tell you, every version of Christianity that's being preached on planet Earth today, they're not all the same. Have you noticed? They don't all have the same doctrinal foundation. I mean, some will... Some will even, you know, they still believe in Jesus dying for your sins, but after that, it can go a bunch of places that we kind of, eh, no, the Word doesn't say that, but anyway. So good and bad. They went out and found as many as they could. And so, uh, so there was room at the wedding feast, and it was filled with guests. All right, go back to Matthew chapter 13. So they went out, cast the net into the sea, and gathered fish, gathered seafood of every kind. Verse 48, which, when it was full, they drew it up to the shore. Now, here's a few things about this. First of all, the shore is not the water. <laughs> I mean, they're close, okay? The, the, there can be a beach there, but they got these things out of the water. Okay, so we're, we are talking about now a, a, a time where the, the thing that's been pulled, the, the, the catch that's been pulled in is being examined. And when the net got full, so what are we talking about when we're talking about fullness? Well, there's a couple of things the Scripture says about that. Keep the place here in Matthew 13. Go, first of all, to Luke chapter 21. And really, I could take you a whole bunch of places <clears throat> in the Scripture that would use the same word, the word Pleureo or pleroma or ple something or other, and it means fullness. But it doesn't just mean a number, it can mean a completion. And sometimes that word is used having to do with time. You know, like it says, in the fullness of time, 
God sent forth his son. Meaning, okay, you, you, we've got there. Okay? And that's one of these here in Luke 21, verse 24. It says, They will fall by the mouth and the edge of the sword and will be led away captive to and among all nations. He's talking about the Jews here. The ones that rejected the invitation to begin with. And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There's that word, that Greek verb. And then in verse 32, it says, Truly, I tell you, this generation, that is, those living at that definite period of time, and that's us, folks, will not perish or pass away until all has been fulfilled. Now, I know in the classic Amplified it says taken place, but it's still the same word, fulfilled, plureo. Now, there's another aspect of fullness. Go to Romans chapter 11. And it doesn't just mean a certain date has arrived. It means a certain set of conditions exists. And here, the set of conditions that exists is something really we have not seen yet, but we're going to see. And my sense of it is soon, and God has invited us to be part of this, even though I look in my mirror and I don't see it. But you know, faith is the evidence of things not seen, so I don't have to see it. If the scripture says it, it's like what Steve was saying this morning. Sooner or later, you know, the, the wheels of justice grind slow, but they grind fine. Sooner or later, what God says is what's going to happen. And not what the pundits on TV, not even what the preachers necessarily say is going to happen. That's what God says. And here in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, he says, Lest you be opinionated, see, and, and people will be. <laughs> I do not want you to miss this hidden truth and mystery. Meaning, this is not something everybody out there knows, and they don't preach this because it's mysterious. Okay? I don't want you to miss this hidden mystery, brethren, that a hardening has befallen a part of Israel to last until the fullness of the Gentiles. Now, your Amplified, your classic Amplified says the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Well, if you want to cover both possibilities here, let's connect that with the net. Okay, the net pulls in the fish, right? Let's go back there, because some of the fish, it says, are good. And, and to be a good fish, you need to be full of God. You need to be full of Jesus, okay? And that's what God originally wanted. That's why he sent his son, so we could be full, so we could be made into his image. Okay, so Romans eleven twenty five is really talking about there will be those that, are, that get there and they get made into his image. And that's not, well, you get born again and then you're a new creature. No, that's just the beginning. Okay, and there's many sermons about that. But anyway, back in Matthew 13, verse 48, it says, When the net was full, they drew it to the shore. They took it out of the water. God looked at it. It's, it's a day of inspection. I think it describes it in 1 Peter and some other places. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels and cast the bad away. Well, I should point out, just like with the fishing videos that I watch on the internet, the ones that they don't want to keep, where do, what do they do with them? Throw them in a dumpster somewhere? No. What do they do with those fish that they release? They put them back in the water. So if somebody doesn't attain to what God has offered to them or they reject it or whatever, where do, you, where do you end up? Back in the world. Right? It's not hell. You're back in the ocean. You're back in the sea. You're back out there with the rest of humanity. 
Okay, even if you are a Christian, but you're a bad Christian. See, there's good Christians and there's bad Christians. You're still a Christian, and, and we'll get to, I'll show you that, how it's not all over even if you're a bad Christian, but that just means you're in the world. You're a worldly Christian. Okay? But they gather them and they separate them. Well, let's talk about gathering. Go to John chapter 17. This is something that Christians have been talking about probably ever since the Middle Ages, ever since the 1500s, maybe even before that. <coughs> the, the, the split between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Church took place actually several hundred years before the Protestant Reformation took place. But the point was there were these splits. And they have continued unabated since then. The church of Jesus Christ is splintered and split into many different denominations, many different doctrinal points of view. I mean, there's Calvinists and Arminians, and you know, there's, there's evangelicals and there's liberals and there's Pentecostals and then there's cessationists and so on and so forth, okay? And, and that's the state of the church. When in fact, what Jesus was saying had to do with a, a bringing together. And, and of course, there have been a lot of attempts through history to bring together Christians of various sources. The National Council of Churches, the World Council of Churches, you know, and there was a, a meeting over at, at, at uh, Eagle Mountain Lake that, that they, you know, a bunch of evangelical charismatics talked to the Pope about all bringing it all back together under one, one thing, okay? This has been talked about before. Well, what gives this traction is that Jesus says bringing together his body into one is something that he wants. It is on God's agenda. But man can't seem to make it work. And it's probably a good thing because then there would be coercion, there would be hierarchy, and there'd be all kinds of stuff like there is with everything else man does. But anyway, John chapter 17, verse 18. Jesus is praying here before he goes to be crucified. He says, Father, just as you sent me into the world, I have sent them, my disciples, into the world. And so for their sake and on their behalf, I sanctify and consecrate myself so that they also may be sanctified, dedicated and consecrated and made holy by the truth. Okay, do you want to be holy? Get the truth. Buy the truth and sell it not. It's not a matter, well, you need to fast, or well, you need to you know, put on sackcloth and ashes, or well, you need to move to a monastery, or well, you need to you know, play the word in your house all the time. I mean, if that's what God is telling you, any of those things is what God's telling you to do, then do it. But what sanctifies us, what makes us holy, what makes us good fish, in my metaphor, is the truth. That's what makes us holy. Okay? Sanctify them with the truth. Neither for these alone do I pray, not just for his 12 disciples, but also for those who will ever come to believe in me because of their teaching, that they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us so that the world may believe and be convinced that you have sent me. And I will say that the degree of division in the, the body of Jesus Christ is one of the reasons why a lot of people in the world don't want to become Christians. They say, well, y'all are just all arguing with each other about every little thing all the time. It, it, you know, what he's saying is that unity would be uh, inviting and disunity is repulsive to people. 
All right, go back to Matthew chapter 13. When the net was full, they drew it in and gathered the good into the vessels and they cast the bad away. Well, who is the they? Well, let's talk about that for just a moment. Back up to Matthew 13, verse 40. It's a different parable, but they are described here in this other parable doing the same thing. Matthew 13, 40. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels. Bingo. That's who the they are. Now let me stop you right there. Bless his heart, John Milton, with his Christian novel, I guess, Paradise Lost, back 300 years ago, put in humanity's mind the picture of angels as they, they are beautiful creatures in white robes with wings and, and they fly around. Well, I recommend that you, you dispense with that picture of what an angel is. Technically, the word angel simply means a messenger. <clears throat> in fact, isn't there some kind of a a, a cell phone program or a computer program or something that calls itself Digital Angel. Whatever that is, it's digital, number one. And again, you can't really confine it to one location in space and time. It's an influence, right? Okay, it's a force. That's why I've used this word, a collective force. We speak of demonic forces that would be influencing people. Well, God's angels can have a force also. Okay? There's another thing going on in the news right now that I find very interesting. It's now the government is starting to say, yeah, there really, there really are UFOs and there really are ETs. And we've known about this for a bunch of decades. And, and uh, you know, now government whistleblowers are saying, yeah, they've, they've been keeping this secret from you. Well, what are those things? Well, they're angels, good or bad. They, they are, and they have qualities, characteristics that humans do not have. <clears throat> See, that was the problem with John Milton trying to describe angels as beautiful women in white robes with wings. He was trying to put a, a human picture on it. And yes, I just told you earlier that they can appear in human form, but they're not stuck with that picture. Okay, so nor are ETs stuck as, as gray little things with big eyes. Okay, so the, the whole realm, the whole angelic realm, it would be better if you don't think of it with one particular picture. Even God's angels, it would be best if you don't think of God's angels in, in just one particular way. Okay, it says, His angels will go forth and, and separate the wheat from the tares, right? And He will gather out of His kingdom all the things that offend and those which do iniquity, and He shall cast them into a furnace of fire where there will be Wailing and gnashing of teeth. Well, I, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, here in a minute. It's not necessarily what tradition has said. What tradition has said is, well, those, there are those people who, who warm a pew in church who are not really Christians, and God's going to move them out of the way and send them to hell. Well, I won't say that can't happen, but that's not all that is referring to. Because remember, we're talking about we're talking about fish here. We're talking about people who have answered the invitation to go to the wedding feast. We're talking about Christians. So are you saying that there can be Christians who can be in a place where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? Yes. And, and it's referred to as a fiery furnace. Go back to Matthew chapter 13. 
verse 49. It says, So it shall be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and they will sever the wicked from the just and they shall cast the wicked into a furnace of fire where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Well, now this is interesting because the word furnace, another meaning of that word in the, the Greek is an oven. You know, that's when in the Holocaust when Hitler and the Nazis, uh, you know, put people, not just Jews, but all kinds of people that were, were enemies of the state or not desirable, when they gassed them, then they burned their bodies in ovens. And of course in Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 it says, the day that comes will burn like an oven. Okay, we're talking about some situations here on planet earth in the, the, the days leading up to when Jesus comes back again. It's going to get very, very hot on planet earth. And if you're not under God's protection, if you're not a good fish at that point, you're going to be burned up. Now, we'll see how that's, that's not, you know, that's not eternal doom necessarily. Okay, but here's something else about this. Keep the place here. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Angels apparently don't have the same uh, window of temperature or comfort that humans have. Okay? Angelic beings, and, and there's one particular kind of angelic being we're going to read here. In Genesis chapter 3, Verse 22, this is part of <coughs> the result of Adam and Eve's sin. It says, the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us to know how to distinguish between good and evil and blessing and calamity. <coughs> and now, lest he put forth, <coughs> excuse me, lest he put forth his hand and take also from the tree of, no, of life and eat. And then there was a pause there. So it could happen, but it didn't. And here's what God did to prevent that from happening. Therefore, the Lord God sent forth <coughs> man from the garden to till the ground, and he placed above the, the garden a cherubim a, with a flaming sword which turned every way to keep and guard the way of the tree of life. Now, not only does the cherubim have a flaming sword, but a cherub itself does actually mean something which is fiery. You know, one of the other things that it says about, in Psalm 104, it says God makes his angels winds. Another place it says, he, or in that same verse, the second part of that verse it says, and he makes his angels flames of fire. So, What are we talking about here? We are talking about forces in our world that are separating out those that are doomed for destruction from those that are not. Okay? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, this is how I know that you can be a Christian and still be in the tribulation, in the wrath of God, where the sun gets seven times hotter and it burns everybody up. <clears throat> you don't want to be there, and there's no real good reason why you should be there, but some will. First 
Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. If anyone builds upon the foundation, whether it's with gold, silver, or precious stones, the work of each will become plainly and openly known because the day of Christ will disclose it and declare it because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test and critically appraise the character and worth of which each person has done. If the work which any person has built on this foundation survives this test, he will get his reward. But if any person's work is burned up under the test, he will suffer the loss of it, though he himself will be saved, but only as one who has passed through the fire. Now let me throw this in. It tells us to not think it strange when we go through fiery trials in our everyday existence. Okay, so all things work to good to the get for the good of those who are called according to God's purpose. Even those fiery trials, even those things which the devil does to try to burn us up, if we will let God use that situation to, to clean us up, if you will, to burn away the dross. Because up here in 1 Corinthians it talks about you can build it with, with gold and silver or you can build it with wood, hay, and stubble, and wood, hay, and stubble burns. All right? Well, the trials we go through can get rid of the stuff in our lives that would cause us to end up here on planet Earth when the wrath of God is being poured out. You know, we're, we're getting a, a, a jump on this thing, folks. We, you really are. What you go through now, it, it's, it's almost like a vaccination in a way. From, if, from, there's a pandemic of fire and your trials that you're going through is a vaccination so that that won't, you know, destroy you. Um, Revelation chapter 7. This confirms it. Revelation 7 verse 9. John is given a, a, a picture of what's going on before God's throne. And he says, After this I looked, and a vast host appeared which no one could count, gathered out of every nation, out of the sea, right? Okay, from all tribes and people. And they stood before the throne, before the Lamb, and they were attired in white robes, and palm branches were given to them. And in a loud voice they cried, Our salvation is due to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb and to them we owe our deliverance. They're saved. I don't think you can argue that these are not saved. They are saved. But look at what they went through. Verse 13. Then addressing me, one of the elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin said, Well, who are these people clothed in the long white robes? And from where have they come? And I replied, Well, sir, you know... And he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, which is the only way anybody can get saved. And for this reason, they are now before the throne of God to serve him day and night in his sanctuary. And he who is seated on the throne <coughs> will spread his tabernacle over them and shelter them by his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, and neither shall the sun smite them or any scorching heat. What does that tell you? That going through the great tribulation subjected them to famine, to no water, and to being burned up 
by the sun and by the heat. Okay? That's where the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth happens. And they came out of that and ended up in heaven, but they died. Now, as we're going to see, that doesn't have to happen to any of us. But there's reasons why some Christians end up in that state. And it has to do with the devil's fishing trip, if you want to call it that. Go to Habakkuk chapter 1. You know, everything that God does, the devil sees that and says, Aha, I need to do that too. Because remember in Isaiah 14, verse 14, the devil has given us his mission statement. He said, I will be like the Most High God. Well, he won't achieve that, but he has told us that is his aim, that is his intention, and that's what he has been about. And that's not going to change. Everything the devil does is an attempt to co-opt God. So, everything that anybody who, how should I say this, lets themselves be influenced by Satan is basically signing on with that agenda to be like God. You know, to, to be selfish is for a person to in themselves to try to be their own God. What I want. You know, that was what you know, saying said, I will do this, I will do that. Well, and ultimately, I will be God. Well, you know, if, if you give in to the devil, he's going to make you kind of want that too. And so, there are those that, that go with that. That's what human history has been littered with that. Um, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 6. Here's an example from Old Testament times having to do with Nebuchadnezzar and his world conquest back then in 600 some odd B.C. God's telling Habakkuk, Behold, I am rousing up the Chaldeans. Now, Chaldea is Babylon. I'll give you a little bit more information about that in a second, but let me, let me finish this. I'm rousing up the Chaldeans, the bitter and impetuous nation who march through the breadth of the earth to take possession of dwelling places that do not belong to them. You know, it's what Jesus said about Satan. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So those who are serving him, ser serving Satan, do the same thing. They are terrible and dreadful. Their justice and dignity proceed only from themselves. They don't have a right from God to do it. They, they define their own right. Keep the place here. You know, let the place in Matthew go now. Um, keep the place here in Habakkuk and go to Genesis chapter 11. What is the importance of Babylon or Chaldea? Well, of course, that's where the Tower of Babel was set up, uh, where humans disobeyed God's command, and so they wanted to bring everything all together according to their ideas of what they wanted, and so God said, uh, uh we're not going to, you know, we're, you're scattering, and so all the different... You know, one went east, one went west, and one went over the cuckoo's nest, as it says. Okay, and it was out of that period of time and out of that, a result of that event, that Abraham and his family were called out of Babylon. Uh, uh, Genesis 11, verse 26. Now, Terah, that's Abraham's father, became the father of Abraham, or Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And this is the history of the descendants of Terah. 
Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. And Haran died before his father in the land of his birth. That is, Ur of the Chaldees. Now, according to J.B. Jackson's Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names, Ur means light. And Chaldees means clod breaker. So here again, we have a picture of what Satan inspires people who want to follow him, who want to worship him, what they are like and what they do. They have a light, a false light. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, Satan uh, it is a, you know, masquerades as an angel of light, so his followers masquerade as, as ministers of righteousness. There's false light, okay? And to, to, to break the clods would be to, to crush the opposition or, or to destroy things so you can create a new world order. And this is what is going on in our world today. The, the life as you know it is, has been altered and they're doing it in slow motion so hopefully you know people won't get too riled up about it but you know if you have looked around and said well this isn't the America I grew up in yeah that's the, that, that was the intention is to break it up to, to, to change it okay that and then um, verse 31 it says, So Terah took Abram, his son, Lot the son of Haran, and his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, Abram's wife. And they went forth together to go from Ur of the Chaldees into the land of Canaan. And when they came to Haran, they settled there. And at Haran, verse, chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Abram, says, Go! For yourself and for your own advantage, away from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name famous and distinguished and you will be a blessing of dispensing good to others. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. So, that describes what happened back then, but it also shows us a picture of what Satan always does. And it shows what God says we are supposed to do when confronted with what Satan does. We're supposed to get out. We're supposed to get out of Dodge, if you will. Now go back to Habakkuk, chapter 1. We're talking about the Chaldeans. Go to verse 15. The Chaldean... Okay, well, let me go to verse 14. This is kind of interesting. Habakkuk is going through a little bit of a complaining session here with God. And he asks a bunch of questions. And this is kind of an interesting question he asks God. He says, God, why do you make men like the fish of the sea, like reptiles and creeping things that have no ruler and are defenseless against their foes? Now, repeatedly we've seen in the scripture where when Israel rejected God as their ruler, they came under attack from, from a, a conquering <coughs> power. Well, the former Christian, quote-unquote, nations of the world have abandoned God by and large. And I would say America has been the last bastion of one of those, as far as I can see. I mean, Europe kind of abandoned Christianity a long time ago and and look look what they've been through in the last several hundred years and so when a, when a people abandons God 
They have no ruler. And so whoever is the strongest of the, of the bad guys comes in and conquers them. It's, it, it has always worked that way, and it will work that way again. Now verse 15. The Chaldean brings up the fish with his hook. Wow, this is the same thing that, that Jesus was telling us God does. Remember, Satan copies God. But he brings him up with a hook. This word hook, it has to do with carving up and delineating and portraying and imprinting. Now what I'm saying to you is these are non-local influences that the devil brings upon humanity and we must guard ourselves against that, against Satan affecting us with his where he wants things to go. Uh, we must guard against letting ourselves just go with the flow, as you, w as you see. Because if he says something, oh, yeah, that sounds good. You know, let's say, uh, you know, you have some, uh, some sexual sin in your life, and, and so, you know, uh, well, you know, it's okay to be gay, or it's okay to be transgender, or it's okay to be this or that, and that sounds good to you. You got hooked by an idea. It's been said, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. A lot of the ideas that we think we have, we didn't originate those ideas. Those ideas got implanted in us somehow. That's what a hook is. Okay? He says he gathers them, he, he pulls them up with his hook, and he drags them forth with his net. Well, here in the Hebrew, the word net means to shut in or to seclude. If you've been caught in a net, you can't get out. And, and according to Davis Bible Dictionary, this word is not just used for fishing. This word is also used for hunting, that they would put, uh, you know, put up this netting somewhere and then they would drive the deer or whatever animal they're trying to catch into this space that's enclosed with this, this net and then close it in and they can't get out. And this is what the devil tries to do with his stuff. He tries to lure us into it and then so we can't get out. Now, with God nothing is impossible, but I'm just saying this is the devil's intention. And unfortunately it works more often than it doesn't. Um, he drags them out with his net, and he gathers them in his dragnet. And that's not just the TV show with Officer Joe Friday. Okay, the dragnet, it says it's something which is dark, and it is concealed. You don't see it. We don't see a lot of the stuff that the devil's doing because it's hidden. It's not intended to be seen. But then look what happens. Verse 16, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to it, to his dragnet. You know, he worships these practices. This is part of his religion, if you will, because from it he lives luxuriously and his food is plentiful and rich. What does that tell us? That when Satan catches you, he eats you. He doesn't just put you back in the world. He puts you in his frying pan and he eats you. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say what that would be a metaphor of, but, you know, we, we see the devil eating, eating people up all the time with all kinds of stuff, with diseases, with, 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 with wars, with, with uh, all kinds of catastrophes. Uh, and... and that's what he does. He eats what he catches. He doesn't catch and release, in other words. All right? Okay, here's the good news. Like I said, this doesn't have to apply to any of us, but, but there, is, there is a requirement. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We talk about this a lot here because it's a 
a, an end time time marker that, and well, Christians have, have known about this, uh, about the Antichrist and the temple and, and so forth. <clears throat> and so, we are not uh, ignorant of how this factors into the end time timeline. But we need to see what exactly the devil is doing to bring this about. And that's the thing I'm saying that it's, it's vital that we understand the, the collective aspect of this. That it's not just a matter of a, of a person's own individual sin, their own, their own individual problem. These are forces that are at work in the world. And just as God is trying to bring as many people to Jesus as He can, good and bad, you know, uh, whether, you, whether you grew up, whether you were raised right by your parents or you had no parents at all, whatever it is, God says, come one, come all. Come to my banquet. And sends the, sends the angels out to bring them in. Well, likewise, the devil says, hey, you know, I, I think I can do that too. And so he puts out his stuff to try to get us confused and to try to get us um, hopeless and so we'll just throw in the towel and just go with the flow. And he uses supernatural things to accomplish that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and working of Satan and will be attended by great power and all sorts of miracles and signs and delusive wonders and by unlimited seduction to evil and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they would not welcome the truth. We can welcome the truth. We can do that. That's not climbing Mount Everest. That's not rocket science. We can welcome the truth. When the truth is brought to us and we say, yeah, that's right, we can welcome it instead of fighting against it. But they refuse to love it that they might be saved. Therefore, God sends upon them a misleading influence, a working of error, a strong delusion to make them believe what is false. Well, <clears throat> The Greek here would give us an understanding to help us see that this is not God just whacking you so you're going to believe a lie because God doesn't do that. There's no fault, there's nothing false in God at all and so he doesn't lie. I mean scripture says that over and over and over. Well then what is he saying here about well God God does this. Okay. It has to do with what this influence is. The word actually in the Greek is energia, from which we get the word energy. When, when you have rejected the truth, it's like you're in limbo. And so the next thing that comes along is going to blow you. Because the, he, he has opened the, opened the gate... He has allowed, if you will, Satan to do what he's doing because people have rejected the truth. So here comes the devil with this influence, this thing that we've been talking about from Habakkuk chapter 1 where, where the devil is bringing a one-world government, a one-world currency, a one-world religion, a one-world everything. Verse 12, in order that all may be judged and condemned who did not believe and adhere to the truth, but instead took pleasure in unrighteousness. But, here's the good news, folks. But, beloved brethren, we ought and are obligated to give thanks to God because God chose you from the beginning to be first fruits for salvation. That's God's intention. He doesn't intend for the devil to do all of this. Through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and your belief in the truth. 
If you will believe the truth, the Holy Spirit will take that truth and He'll clean you up. Uh, let me say, I rely on that. Okay? And it was to this end that He called you through the gospel so that you may obtain a share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold fast to the tradition and instruction with which you were taught, whether by word or mouth, word of mouth or by letter. Now, we're not saying that, well, okay, then I got taught by such and such a church back when I was little, so I should go with that. He's Paul's talking about what he was uh, directed by the Holy Spirit to teach. Well, what is that? It's the New Testament, folks. It's the Word. Okay, that's so. So don't look at that. And say, oh, 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 the tradition of my church is such and such. No, this is the tradition he's talking about. Okay, the news that never changes. Okay, verse sixteen. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us <coughs> and gave us everlasting consolation and encouragement and well-founded hope through His grace, comfort and encourage your hearts and strengthen them, make them steadfast and keep them unswerving. This is what we need. Keep our hearts steady. Stay on course for every good work and every word. That's how it happens. Through the word and us welcoming that. So Father, show us by your Holy Spirit when the devil is trying to collect us into something that's not of you. <clears throat> and Father, I thank you that we have the hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have a home with you in the heavens. But help us to also see that that's not just some golden daybreak, but that that's something that we can accept or reject every day and, and give us that grace to always accept your word, the truth, and never to reject it. And we give you praise and glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Phil.